drive Rod the parking lot, he'll be back. <laughs> Announcements. <laughs> I understand there's at least one. So make the announcements, please. Please, I'm not ready yet, so okay. keep going. <laughs> One doesn't eat that much. Yeah. <laughs> Are you aware that Greg is going to? Well, Susan talked to her and she said not to worry too much because we changed something for that. So I didn't yeah. put that on there. There's also going to be a cooler on the front porch, um, and you can like if you have your meal there by four o'clock, you can put your meal in the cooler. That Anything else? Well then, shall we begin? I invite you to stand. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the wellspring of grace, our Easter, and our joy. Amen. Look, here is water. Here, here is our water. Immersed in the promises of baptism, let us give thanks for what God has done for us. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning your voice thundered over the deep, and water became the essence of life. Adam and Eve beheld Eden's verdant rivers. The ark carried your creation through the flood into a new day. Miriam led the dancing as your people passed through the sea into freedom's land. In a desert pool, the Ethiopian official entered your boundless baptismal life. Look, here is water. Here is our water of life. Hallelujah. At the river, your beloved son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit. By the baptism of Jesus' death and resurrection, you opened the floodgates of your reconciling love, freeing us to live as Easter people. We rejoice with glad hearts, giving all honor and praise to you, through the risen Christ, our source of living water, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Look, here is water. Here is our water of life. Hallelujah. <laughs>
how some of us were singing the yeah. V's and thou's that were on the screen <laughs> while others were singing <laughs> what's on the sheet, <laughs> which is a freshened up modern English <laughs> version. <laughs> Alleluia, Christ is risen. The grace of our risen Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. This is the feast of victory. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O Lord Christ, good shepherd of the sheep, you seek the lost and guide us into your fold. Feed us and we shall be satisfied. Heal us and we shall be whole. Make us one with you, for you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit one God, now and forever. Amen. The first lesson is from the fourth chapter of Acts, verses 5 through 12. The next day, the rulers, elders, and scribes assembled in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. When they had made the prisoners stand in their midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are questioned today because of a good deed done to someone who was sick and are asked how this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel, that this man is standing before you in good health by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders. It has become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. The word of the Lord. We will 23 responsively. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He revives my soul and guides me along right pathways for his name's sake.
You spread a table before me in the presence of those who trouble me. You have anointed my head with oil and my cup is running over. The second lesson is from the third chapter of 1 John, verses 16 to 24. We know love by this, that Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses help? Little children, let us love, not in word or speech, but in truth and action. And by this, we will know that we are from the truth and will reassure our hearts before him whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have boldness before God, and we receive him whatever we ask, because we obey his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we should believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. All who obey his commandments abide in him, and he abides in them. And by this we know that he abides in us, by the spirit that he has given us. The word of the Lord. All right, children. 
not going to come up because I'm carrying a big stick, I'm sure. <laughs> All right. So I don't know if you noticed, if you have anybody told you this morning, but they have a, a name that we give this Sunday, a couple names we give it actually. One of them is the fourth, right, fourth Sunday in of Easter. It's the fourth Sunday in w that we celebrate the Easter festival, but it's also called Good Shepherd Sunday. How many of you know what a shepherd is? Yes? Oh, I'm not going to embarrass you yet. You know what a shepherd is? You ever heard of a shepherd? What is a sh Can you tell me what a shepherd does? Gathers sheep. Gathers sheep. Yeah, takes care of sheep, right? Do you ever see sheep in the fields around here? You ever see a shepherd out there with the sheep? No, because I think we have fences and, uh, and we don't tend to send shepherds out into the wild. But, but in Jesus' day and, and where Jesus is from, the shepherds actually go out into the wilderness, they call it. It's out kind of like a desert. And they follow their sheep around to help them find water and grass to eat. And they do something else. They keep the sheep safe and protect them. Something that they carry, these shepherds, is called a crook. And it looks a little bit like this except that it doesn't have this cross in the middle and it's a little more open. I should have brought my shepherd's crook from my office this morning instead of this one. And the shepherd's crook is an important tool for the shepherd. What do you think I could do with this? <laughs> no, nothing from you out there. <laughs> Some people have ideas I don't want to hear. What do you think a shepherd could do with this? Let's say a wolf came and threaten the sheep. What could the shepherd do with this? Whack them with it, yes. <laughs> Whack them with it. Poke them, get them away from the sheep. Go away. You could even swing it at them. I'm not going to swing it here because I'm afraid I might hit something. So that's one thing. The shepherd can use the crook to protect the sheep by keeping the wolves or other predators away. Now let's say we have a sheep that's not too bright, as I understand sheep aren't. And that sheep wants to wander off into some danger. Maybe it wants to go its own way while the shepherd's saying, this is the way to the, to the grass to eat. What do you think I could do with this if a sheep was running away? Anyone have an idea? How about you stand up, one of you? Somebody stand up for me. Stand up for me, please. I'm not going to hurt you. Don't worry. But could you just imagine if you were trying to get away and I could hook you and pull you back in, right? <laughs> a shepherd can pull you back away from danger. I could also whack you back away from danger, but that would hurt. So I try to pull you gently. That's what Jesus does for us. Jesus protects us from danger. Jesus pulls us back into the flock, into the protected area, into the the community and with all these people. Sometimes we feel like wandering off or maybe getting into trouble and Jesus is always coming after us saying, come back. I'm going to hook you and pull you back in because Jesus wants us to be safe and wants us to be in this community to know that we are loved. That's how the, the shepherd shows love for the sheep. Jesus shows love for us. And we are told today in one of our readings that we are to show love for one another in the same way because that's how Jesus does the work that Jesus does. Jesus, you don't see Jesus walking around with a stick and by us, do you? But we know that other people are there to protect us, our parents, some other folks around that will protect us and also call us back into the flock, into this community. So can we all give thanks to God for Jesus? 
for Jesus who protects us and who guides us and leads us? Can we do that? We'll say a simple prayer. We'll just say, thank you, Jesus. How about we do that together? Ready? One, two, three. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You may go back. God tortured you enough. According to St. John. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. The Gospel of the Lord. What image comes to mind for you when you hear the good shepherd? Perhaps it is the image of Jesus sitting with his shepherd's crook and the sheep and lambs around him in a nice irenic setting. Or it is the image of Jesus with that, sh that lamb draped over his shoulders, reminding us of how Jesus goes to find the one leaving the 99 behind and then brings that one back. Whatever it is, I'm sure it involves some fuzzy little animals and a guy with a long stick or carrying a sheep. But what if the image that Jesus is getting at here is not one of a literal shepherd not one of somebody who is taking care of a flock of sheep or goats, but instead is an image of a king. An image of someone who rules over people. If you were among the crowds listening to Jesus speak these words, that is more likely the image you would have. Because in the Old Testament and in the Bible as a whole, the term shepherd most often refers to royalty, to the king. God says to the kings of Israel and Judah that if they will not shepherd his people as they ought to, that God will take care of it himself and God will be the good shepherd. So when Jesus says to those who are gathered with him, those leaders of the, of the temple, almost those who almost consider themselves a kind of royalty, and Jesus says to them the words, I am the good shepherd, he is challenging them, challenging who they think they are or how they consider themselves as rulers. Jesus says to them, you are not doing such a hot job. But I, Jesus, am the good shepherd. 
I think of that, and I think of how daring those who speak in our texts today are. Jesus, in, in telling these rulers of the temple that they are not such good leaders and that Jesus is the good shepherd, tells them how it is that a good shepherd is to lead, how a good ruler is to lead. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The good shepherd does not look at the sheep as something to be exploited, used for their own purposes, does not even look at the shepherd's position and power as something to be used, is not there to be protected by the sheep, but is there to protect the sheep. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And I take note that in the context when, in which Jesus speaks these words, it comes right after he heals a man who has been born blind. And we see what happens if we go back in the text to read about that man born blind, what happens when he gains his sight, how he is challenged by those shepherds. Who gave you your sight? What business do you have seeing? You've been blind from birth. Show us where this guy is who did this horrible deed. Who dares to do that in our temple? In a similar way, in Acts, Peter and John, who have just healed a man who was lame and given him the ability to walk and dance and jump, how they too are challenged by these same rulers. Maybe not the exact same people, but people in the same position. What gives you the right to heal this man? What gives you the power? Whose name are you using when you do this? It's not ours, so how can you be doing such a thing? The rulers of the temple are looking out for their own well-being, their own power, and do not want to be challenged by those who come in the name of Jesus, or any other name for that matter. I must say, these readings today give me pause. For they call on us, especially our second reading, to follow Jesus in the way that Jesus has gone. Not just to follow in word and in speech, as John puts it, but in truth and in deed. Where Jesus lays down his life for the people, we ought, as John says, to lay our own lives down, to give ourselves for the sake of others. That is not something that is easy to conceive. Much more easy it is to conceive of those disciples on the day of Jesus' crucifixion who suddenly don't seem to be anywhere to be found, who have disappeared into the crowds, perhaps, so as not to be taken up with him and lifted up with him. Much easier to imagine being there than to imagine standing up like Peter and John or as Jesus before the rulers of this age to challenge them and to give our lives, perhaps even literally, This is a challenge to me and perhaps to you. It's easy to sing the words that our choir sang. 
I have decided to follow Jesus. As long as following Jesus is comfortable and easy, it is harder to say those words, to sing those words, when we are called to lay our lives on the line, to speak in a time when speaking can be dangerous, can be life-threatening, to speak out against the powers of this world that call on us to seek life in places where there is no life, to follow those who lead to the way of death. It's much easier when we can do it, we can say we follow in word without having to take any action. But the time comes, there are times that come when we must speak out, when we must speak against something in this world and risk ourselves perhaps our reputation, our safety, even our lives. Yet again, I say it is not something easy to consider, to imagine. So I know for myself I have plen had plenty of opportunities to speak up in which I have not out of fear, even though I have decided to follow Jesus. I have taken the easy path and kept silent. But Jesus calls us to speak up, to speak out. When we see those who are hungry, to feed them. When we see those thirsty, to give them drink. When we see those imprisoned, to visit them. The sick, to visit and touch and heal. to speak well of our neighbors even when we're not so sure we like them and ultimately to lay our lives down for them. I tell you that no amount of deciding on our part can make it possible for us to do that. No amount of resolve because our resolve will, be, will fall flat when challenged when our lives are threatened. But as Peter and John in the temple before those rulers were given to speak, we too will receive the Holy Spirit that will cause us to do what we cannot do of our own will. It was the Holy Spirit that filled Peter that enabled him to speak the words that, that I think are words that are so challenging. See them again. This Jesus in whose name we have healed, you crucified, he says to the rulers. You crucified. It's his name we speak, as if that isn't going to raise a little bit of ire from those who hear that. How dare you say, I crucified Jesus. How dare you use that name after we worked so hard to get rid of him? I would think that if Peter and John had been thinking rationally, they would not have named the name of Jesus in that place before those people for fear that they would have been killed as well. But the Holy Spirit filled them. The same Spirit that filled Jesus at his baptism. The same spirit that Jesus pours out onto the world and into us that calls us together. It is the spirit that works like those sheep herding dogs in Scotland that round up the sheep and bring them together into one flock. That spirit that rounds us up, calls us together to be the church, to speak on behalf of the poor, and the needy to work on behalf of the marginalized. To speak the word of Jesus into this world. Not to lift ourselves up, but to raise up the one who laid his life down for us. And when that spirit fills us and when we speak and act, it is then 
that Jesus was raised, raised before us and before the world, and his power becomes known. I am the good shepherd, says Jesus. Thanks be to God, he does not require us to be the good shepherd before he forgives us and gives us his spirit. I am the good shepherd, says Jesus. And I lay my life down for you and for many. And I call you to be my flock, he says. You hear Jesus' voice. And because you are of Jesus' flock, you know it is him who calls. And you know that with his spirit, you will have no other choice but to follow. Amen. With the whole church, let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, 
who suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Rejoicing that Jesus is risen and love has triumphed over fear, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need of good news. Shepherding God, gather your church whenever we wander from you and one another. Empower our church and ministries around the world to worship and serve alongside global companions as equal partners and co-workers in the gospel. God of grace. grace. Nurturing God, preserve the health of biomes and ecosystems, inspire scientists, researchers, conservation organizations, and all people entrusted with the task of caring for creation, that we may be better stewards of the world around us. God of grace. grace. Almighty God, lead nations and communities to share resources, cooperate in solving conflicts, and listen to the wisdom of indigenous peoples. Help all those with power to share it and to use such power for good. God of grace. Loving God, protect the very young and the very old, those living without housing, victims of domestic abuse, and all who live with chronic illness or compromised immune systems, especially Beth, Raymond, Kasaya, Barry, Joanne, Barb, Duane, and all others we name. Guide communities to actively care for people who are vulnerable. God of grace. Gracious God, help this in all communities of faith to listen for your voice. Call us away from things that distract us from following you. Invite us to more deeply love and serve people who are lonely, isolated, and on the margins. God of grace. Living God, we give thanks for our ancestors in faith. Strengthen us to share the good news in our own day. God of grace. Into your hands, most merciful God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your abiding love through Jesus Christ, our resurrected and living Lord. Amen. Peace of the Lord be with you always.
Let us pray. Oh, that's a different prayer than in the bulletin too. Read the one on the board. Risen one. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and ever-living God. But chiefly we are bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of our Lord. For he is the true Passover lamb who gave himself to take away our sins who by his death has destroyed death, and by his rising has brought us to eternal life. And so with Mary Magdalene and Peter, and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures, and with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord. You are indeed holy, almighty, and merciful God. You are most holy, and great is the majesty of your glory. You so loved the world that you gave your only Son, that whoever believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Having come into the world, he fulfilled for us your holy will and accomplished our salvation. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his salutary command, his life-giving passion and death, his glorious resurrection and ascension, and his promise to come again, we give thanks to you, Lord, God Almighty, not as we ought, but as we are able. And we implore you mercifully to accept our praise and thanksgiving, and with your word and Holy Spirit to bless us, your servants, and these your own gifts of bread and wine that we and all who share in the body and blood of your Son may be filled with heavenly peace and joy, and receiving the forgiveness of sin may be sanctified in soul and body, and have our portion with all your saints. All honor and glory are yours, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in your holy church, both now and forever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, 
The risen Christ is made known to us in the breaking of the bread. Come and eat at God's table.
rather than me turning around to pray, say the prayer, would you? Shepherd and God. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. It sounds like you're all ready to go home and take a nap. Let's try that without you. <laughs> Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. The God of resurrection power, the Christ of unending joy. And the spirit of Easter hope bless you now and forever. Amen. Amen. children will now show their joy? <laughs> How's that going to happen? <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Go in peace, rejoice, and be glad. <laughs>